Yeah, we are live now, ma'am. Okay, so shall we start? Then you start. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. A warm welcome from Arini Kathmandu. Uh, I'm Sosti Bhadra, your moderator for today's session on behalf of the Society of Nepalese Architects and the Subcommittee on Professional Practice, the 13th Executive Committee. I would like to thank you all for joining us for the 19th Architect Speak series. Uh, if you're unable to participate in this webinar directly, uh, our session is also being live streamed on Sona's Facebook page, so do join us there. I hope you're all set um, uh, with a steaming cup of coffee because we have a very special session in store for you with a very eminent speaker, Dr. Benny Kuriakos, who's joined us all the way from Chennai, India. Thank you and welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, Benny is joining us for the 19th Architect Speak series. Uh, in today's webinar, Benny Kuriakos will be sharing his experiences through the years in working with the design of various projects, ranging from a tsunami rehabilitation project to heritage conservation plans for historic areas, resorts, institutions, residences, using his knowledge of vernacular architecture. He started his career in 1984 and received the basic lessons in architecture under the tutelage of Laurie Baker. After receiving the Charles Wallace India Trust Award, for an MA in Conservation Studies at the University of York, he completed his doctorate from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He is known more for his work of the design of public buildings and the transplantation of the buildings in the Kerala section of the craft village known as Dakshina Chitra in Chennai. Major architectural works include the Muziris Heritage Project, the Institute of Palliative Medicine in Calicut, the design of the tsunami affected villages of Chinnangudi and Tarangbadi in Nagapattinam district, the Springdale Heritage Resort in Vande Periyar, and the Anantya Resort in Kanyakumari. He has also authored the book, Conserving Timber Structures in India, and is one of the editors of the book, Guidelines for the Preparation of a Heritage Management Plan. Along with this, he has also worked as a consultant to UNDP, UNESCO, various state governments, and other organizations. Uh, after his presentation, we will open the floor for questions, so please send in your questions to the Q&A box. You can also post them on Sona's Facebook page where uh, our session is being streamed live. We'll try to get to as many as possible, uh, time permitting. And now without wasting any further time, I would like to hand over the screen to Dr. Benny Kuni Akus. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me, Society for the Nepalese Architects. And uh, I'll straight away go into the presentation. Just give me a second. Okay, right. See, in this presentation, I'm not going to talk about my projects as such, but uh, uh, I would like to talk about my journey or how I came to this stage. Uh, uh, what were the major steps? How did I try to learn many things? How did I do the projects? That is what I'm just trying to explain in the project. This is one of the Malayalam, I mean, from Kerala. Malayalam is the language talked uh, talk by people in Kerala. So this is one of the buildings done by the famous British born Indian architect, Laurie Baker. And unfortunately this building is now, it is, it is, it is demolished now. This is a three story small house, which was done for at that time in the seventies for 10,000 rupees. And uh, it was featured in one of the magazines I've taken this cover page photograph. My interest was in photography. I never I had any interest in architecture. Uh, so I used to have a black and white develop, uh, studio developer and all those things at home. And uh, after the plus two, which is the just before the university in India, we call it pre-degree or plus two. Um, when you finish the school, and uh, I had wanted to take cinematography. That was my primary interest. But uh, I had a discussion with uh, my father and he said that, I mean, film field is a very, very difficult field. You don't know whether you'll be successful. I mean, you had to think that it is 40 years ago, whether the photography is a, I mean, it was not a major profession the way it is being seen now. So uh, I was, uh, he so he discouraged me from taking uh, cinematography. So his uh, so he, what he told me was that you go and do 
cinematography after you take a degree you have a university degree so even if you are not successful in the photography field you can just get some job somewhere it will not be so that is where he i mean uh, he i had to look at another option so one of the option was the engineering at that time i mean even now civil engineering and the architecture used to be part of the same co same college uh, there was no entrance test or anything when i passed out it was based purely on the marks from the plus 2 examination and uh, i asked one of my cousin what is the difference between civil engineering and architecture as a young uh, person i did not know the difference between civil engineering and architecture so i asked what is the difference and uh, one of my cousin, cousin who is a professor of civil engineering he told me that architects deals with the strength of the buildings engineering aspects of the building no civil engineering deals with the strength and engineering aspects of the building but architecture deals with the aesthetics of building this is the simple definition he tried to give me uh, about the question i asked him about the difference between the two and as a as a person who is very keen on photography i re, i thought that you can't teach aesthetics you have, i mean aesthetics is something which is i won't say in born is something which you do it out of your own based on your experience you can't teach composition but definitely you can teach the technical aspects of photography how to give the lighting if you give two lights or three lights what is going to happen the aperture there are a lot of technical aspects so i try to compare it with photography i thought that architecture is not something which is which can be taught so i took civil engineering and uh, within the next one or two years i realized that a uh, civil engineer has to deal with airport engineering irrigation engineering water resources uh, uh docks harbor engineering all these things which i never had an interest this is not what i wanted to study so uh, after some time i lost interest in civil engineering because i thought i was on the wrong and i tried to continue my interest in cinematography and uh, uh i just managed to pass the civil engineering degree i just that is what i, I just scraped through i had some of the marks which i got was the lowest in my class or my college which i got so very very low internal as marks and some of the written papers also i had but i managed to pass so when there is a finally a project which the civil engineers have to do i mean it's not a full time project and i has taken up a project on biogas plants that was my thing biogas means not the typical biogas plants at that time it this was in 1984 i wanted to study whether septic tanks septic tanks can be replaced by biogas plants you put the night soil all the waste in i mean now it is very common it is become but at that time such a thinking process was not there you put all the waste so the money that you spend on a septic tank in a house you spend a little bit more you get a biogas plant gas is a by product the primary aim is the treatment of the waste so as part of the study there were already biogas plants inside the city government used to give subsidies for setting a biogas plant so i used to did a field study of the existing biogas plants whether people what are the social aspects cultural aspects so i did a survey of the biogas plants because many of the biogas plants according to my survey which i did at that time although many plants were installed people were not using it due to various reasons some had social reasons some were not able to maintain the plants because those were the days when the steel domes were there so you have a if the steel do, dome have a corrosion and if the gas leaks then it is very difficult to repair the i mean initially they can set up the plant but maintaining the plant was not very easy because of the corrosion so when i was doing the field survey uh i just bumped into lorry baker because one house which had the biogas plant next door baker was working at a site and baker at that time was not that famous generally people use this is one of the newspaper reports on baker's uh building and the employees going on state planning board building that is the spb building when the building was going to come up the labor the employees were on strike because against the vice chairman of the planning board saying that i mean this building will not last you are allowing baker to design the building because uh, to kill us i mean so that that kind of thing there was a fierce psychosis among the general person 
So when I, uh, at the end of the meeting, I asked him, he was not very famous. So at the end of the meeting, I asked him, can I come and work with you? That was the question I asked him. And he said, I'm doing very cost effective buildings. I don't have that money to pay. Uh, so I said, I'm not interested in money, but I would like to know how you are working, how you are doing, because uh, the, generally the engineers as well as the architects at that time were not very pro Baker. Now it, things have changed quite a bit. But I joined him. At that time, I had no intention of designing even a 250 square feet building. So he will, uh, I learned like uh, the typical gurukula where the teacher, where the student stays in the teacher's house and learning from him. Because I had no, no idea about architecture or how architecture is to, be, uh, is to be done designing buildings. But I liked him as a person. He was a Gandhian. He was more of a humanist, uh, loving person. And uh, he never had an office. He used to work at the site. So we, I used to work at the site. So when I was working with him at the site, I mean, I had nothing much, much else to do. So I will do some measure, measurement of the buildings or uh, doing brickwork, doing plastering work, because there were construction laborers or the craftsmen doing the work. I also joined them in carrying the mortar and doing the plastering and the pointing. So this is one way where I learned many of the minute aspects of the details, because what you learn in the college, the theoretical thing, etc., might not, I mean, I'm not talking about the theory, but many of the things when they do it in a practical way, it is very different. For example, I mean, the drawings will say one is to two is to four as the concrete mix, but in practice, that was, uh, it was not at all like that. I mean, it was not, uh, but they always added more sand to it. I mean, this was the practical. So I remember uh, when the drawing says one is to two is to four, and he used to have a quarrel with one of the masons doing the concreting. And he said, always we add more sand than, the, than what is mentioned. And only later on, I realized that adding more sand is because of the bulking of the sand. I asked Baker, he also told me. So there were many things which I learned in a practical format. So a lot of my knowledge and what I apply it in my buildings is learned from the craftsmen, from the carpenters, from the masons, from the electricians, plumbers, and all those things, etc. But when I was working with him, I grew, uh, my interest in architecture took, and one of the books I read was Hassan Fathi's book, Architecture for the Poor. And it was in one of the libraries there. And uh, another book which I uh, read at that time, Workbook of an Unsuccessful Architect. Hassan Fathi is very famous, but Harry Stone is not that famous. He is one who studied in the Yale University and he uh, took part in the student struggle. In the 60s, America, a lot of student struggles were there. And he practiced as a town planner. He traveled across Europe. And the entire book is written with his hand. So it is not typeset or anything. So, I mean, uh, so the title, just like the entire book is handwritten by him. So, which was a book which he is talking about his experience of becoming an architect. Even Hassan Fathi is talking about his experience of doing the earth buildings in this place. The other thing is that, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright and Corbusier were the most famous architects. And uh, uh, what I did at that time was to read some of the books. One of the books which I read was Corbusier's The City of Tomorrow and Its Planning. It's a book which influenced me tremendously. This book is written in the 1920s and Corbusier argues why the roads have to be wider. Why should automobiles go very fast? And also he is talking about, I mean, he is telling that uh, cosmetic thing will not work in city planning where to do surgery. So he was talking about a very different concept. He was giving the logical reasoning for about his thoughts. You know, when he, uh, Kurbuzi also wrote the book, he was it, it was in the 1920s. He was he might not have been that famous. He he did most of the other projects of Chandigarh. He did it in the in the 50s, second half of the 1950s. So uh, Kurbu, I mean, so this is what he said. And uh, one of the things which I did when I worked with, this is a sketch of the Palpanaburam Palace and an article will, which came in the Malayalam magazine. See, when I worked with Laurie Baker, Laurie Baker always used to praise Palpanaburam Palace. He said, this is the best example of the timber architecture. This is the best example of a vernacular architecture. And this is one of the 
traditional architecture of Kerala. Everything about architecture can be learned in this building. And this is a protected monument, not a world heritage. It is a state protected monument. Quite a large, it's, it's there in, I think it's six and a half acres of land. And a lot of buildings built at various periods. And uh, Baker, I mean, there was no measure drawing uh, made as part of the building. So I took some initiative and with the funding of the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, Intact was formed only in 1984, so immediately after that. So this also happened in 1984, and uh, we just did the measure drawing of the palace. So I was part of the team. So I got out of some of, my, some of the juniors, some of the architects I know, et cetera. And uh, Benesri Mitra, she is in Delhi now. She was one of the persons who led the team, because I did not know much to how to do the buildings or how to do, do the work. And uh, this is the photograph of the building, beautiful complex, and another photograph of the same building complex. There are, so uh, doing the measure drawing of this building, and most of these details in these buildings were never used in the, in the contemporary buildings at that time, 70s or 80s. So it gave me the bay windows, the ventilation, the timber jallies, the sloping roofs, how to do it sloping roofs, all these things. And, and I mean, the buildings were very simple. There was no, it's not the front elevation, which is important. All the elevations are important. And it is not, I mean, these are, uh, there was not a single architect or anybody. Of course, there would have been an architect who would have been a master carpenter or master craftsman at that time. But I realized how the buildings as a complex is looking nice with the varying shapes of the roofs varying heights of the roofs, et cetera. So this was one of the things where I learned a little bit about the traditional architecture. I learned about how Baker is doing the buildings. That is another thing which I learned. And uh, uh, then I met a very um, uh, interesting person called Apukutan Nair. Apukutan Nair was a retired chief engineer. He's, um, he took his master's in public health engineering. He was uh, from the US. And he was uh, heading, he was the chief engineer of the public health engineering department of the government of Kerala. So I met him accidentally because he has done, somebody told me he has done some traditional buildings, theaters. So, I mean, he has done the Kalakshetra theater and he has done the Kerala Kalamandalam. So what I've given is the sketch of the Kerala Kalamandalam theater, which was built in the 1970s. I think it came in 19. 73 or 74 kind of period. It might have been inaugurated in 1975. So this theater is very interesting to see that when every government building, I mean, it's part of the Kerala Kalamandalam, which is, a, which is it has become a university now. So, so this is the main auditorium or the theater in that. It's a, it's a university for traditional performances and traditional song, I mean, dance forms, etc. they teach there, Kadagali, Mohini Atom, et cetera, they teach them. So this theater was done in 1970s when nobody used to talk about critical regionalism or many of these things. And so I just got interested and I used to meet him very often. So he used to, I mean, initially he said, everybody comes to me to do a thesis or a dissertation or to do a project. You are the first person coming to me for not doing a thesis or project. So after two, three meetings, he started become very friendly. So I used to ask him a lot of questions. How do you design traditional? What are the rules? What do the ancient texts say? He as a man, he knew Sanskrit. He knew a lot of these traditional texts because, uh, and because of the older generation. Then he used to tell me slowly what traditional architecture, what are the traditional texts and all those things. So that's how I learned. And this is the theater he has designed. He is not not at all. He has done only very few buildings. And uh, this is the theater he has done in Chennai, which was featured in uh, Paris exhibition and uh, etc. So we had, a, I mean, I was very lucky to get an opportunity to, to renovate this, this theater. I mean, it was inaugurated last year. I mean, this is the theater he has built in Kerala, which is the first of the day. He has done only few designs, but all of the designs were superb or followed the traditional principles. And that is, this is the theater in Chennai, which we had renovated, designed by Apokuta Nair. I had the opportunity to renovate. And this was inaugurated last year. This is one of my, Sreya from my office receiving the 
this thing. I could not attend the inauguration function because I had committed to some programs earlier. This was inaugurated uh, last year in, uh, in, in February. So all these, Apukuta Nair was one of the major influences in me. In 1985, there was a stadium in Trivandrum City. I grew up in Trivandrum City. It is, and the government wanted to construct a big gallery around it. It is right in the heart of the city. 250 meters long and 18 meters high. I thought it, and it's violating all the government rules, etc. I was 23 years old at that time. I have left Baker. I worked with Baker for less than a year, nine months. I traveled across India for two, three months. And after that, I came back to Trivandrum. When I came back to Trivandrum, the stadium was going to be constructed. I thought it is utter, I mean, without looking at any safety norms, without uh, looking at any of the government rules, government was adamant. There was some some people in the government who was very ad adamant in trying to construct uh, uh, this gallery, which I thought, I mean, the, the main interest of constructing the gallery was commercial. Under the stadium, there were three floors of shopping malls kind of thing which they planned. And this being this in the heart of the city, so you can see the photograph where, I mean, where the gallery is coming up, uh, coming up. So uh, I thought it is not right and I decided to question it. So I filed a case in the High Court and this is the stadium owned by the Police Welfare Society. The uh, police department used to own the stadium. So I put a uh, public interest litigation case, which is there. And uh, this is one of the rare cases where the public interest litigation, the High Court ruled in favor of me. Uh, but then, uh, uh, see, I will never fight a public interest litigation anymore I this after that, because when I tried to fight for this stadium construction, everybody blamed me. I mean, initially, some of my friends stood by me, but after some time, everybody blamed me, saying that you got a lot of publicity, you are doing it for publicity. So this is one of the things where people will face when they try to do a, try to do a good thing. Uh, there were others who will misunderstand things. So after that, I've never, one of the, one, I, I mean, I still act very uh, reasonably in public, but I decided that it is not my issue. Everybody has to fight this cause. So this is the stadium. You can see the construction. One of the condition was that it, they, they had originally planned to construct the gallery all around it. You can see there are three of floors below the gallery. And uh, one of the agreement with the police department or the judgment said that it can never be used for commercial purposes. And so, uh, so there were certain things with rule, uh, but only thing is that I was not able to succeed to demolish the stadium. I did not get a stay in the high court, so I did not, so, uh, but I was able to stop the stadium halfway in between, which was, uh, uh, where, I mean, I, when I look back, but it taught me so many lessons of how to study. So for example, the stadium which they had made had only 666. At the, in the 80s, etc., football stampeds were very common. So I studied the Munich Olympic Stadium plan and said there are 25 exits planned, but in this, where a capacity of 35,000, only five exits have been there. So if a stampede occurs, then the safety norms are not followed. So like that, I just, that is one of the reasons which I've won in the high court and that's how it started. And at that time, there was, this organization was formed, Center of Science and Technology for Rural Development. It was an organization based out of Trichu. The chairman of the organization was Achyuda Menon, who was the former chief minister. Chandradat, uh, who was the director of Postcode, he was the director. I joined as the joint director. It was meant to popularize the, uh, many of the techniques in rural areas. So at the Center of Science and Technology for Rural Development. And when I joined the organization, the uh, Cosford uh, uh, decided to carry out uh, housing also as one of the activities. At that time, Baker was the only person doing cost-effective housing. There was not, the building center movement has not taken place. All these uh, building centers were not there. And uh, I was doing some projects here and there. And uh, so this is 1986 in February, it happens. So I joined, uh, so we started doing some building and these were, for example, this was a building. One of the first, there were three buildings, demonstration buildings we did. Small houses using various principles. For example, this house was 
uh, the so bond, I mean, the superstructure was with, built with stone. The internal partitions, because we did not want a thick wall because carpet area will be less. So we used a four and a half inch brick wall. So it was a building built with a combination of stone and uh, brick. Stone was quarried from the same location. You can see the uh, photograph on the right where it was done. And there's, this was another building which was done where the uh, bottom portion, I mean, which is painted and plastered has been done with mud bricks or earth bricks. The house owner himself has made the earth brick. So there was no cost involved. And he had the cattle shed, which he extended with the thatch thing. So we had uh, some, some of these elements and the roof was timber because he, 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 he was able to get some local timber, not very costly timber. So we did a timber roof for this. And this was another house which was done, but entirely with brick. We used the rat trap bond for this, this, this building to save on the cost of the bricks. This, this house was made for a factory worker. So he didn't have stone. He was not able to make the earth brick. So because of that, we decided to uh, get, the, uh, get, get it done in brick. So these three were done. As part of these three projects, we did a, a cost for, did a training program for various people. So Laurie Baker was the main person who, I mean, he was the only person who carried out the training program. And a lot of architects and engineers became part of the thing and many of them became quite famous and each one of them started trying to do various buildings. And uh, this was a building which I started designing in 1985. Uh, so see how it started when I left Baker in 1985, I never thought I'll be able to design even a 250 square feet building, a small house. But after some time, I mean, Baker was in great demand, but he was not easily approachable or he did not, I mean, uh, I mean he had a lot of projects in his hand. A lot of people wanted to use Laurie Baker techniques uh, because filler slab, exposed brickwork, arches, rat trap bond and all these things. So uh, many people ask me, why don't you design my house? Uh, why don't you uh, do so that's how I got into the design so this was the first house which I designed it is in a small town part called Quartem uh, by the river by the river side and uh, uh, it is an arc shape because we wanted a view from all the rooms uh, and uh, after that a lot of projects came and I never had to look back in 1986, that is, I was doing, working with Cosford and doing various projects. 1986, British Council and INTAC announced a scholarship scheme for people to go abroad and study about conservation. And uh, I applied, most of the, uh, it was mostly architects, but because it's a UK degree, they had the flexibility. So being a civil engineer, I applied. And when I applied for the scholarship, the interview board asked me, have you heard about a building being demolished in Kerala? So at that time, there was a magazine called Illustrated Weekly. Now that, that is no longer published. It was a very popular weekly. And in that demolition of a Desha Mangalamana, which you see in this photograph, was featured. And when the article came, so the interview board, the first question to me, do you know about this building, which is feature, uh, which where it is being demolished? So the very interesting thing is that I tried to save this building to the maximum. I had visited this building earlier. I took the photographs and I told the interview board, the photograph which has come in the illustrated weekly is a photograph taken by me. Because as I said earlier, I was interested in photography, but now I don't do photography. There was a time when I used to do photography in a, a very uh, serious manner. Slowly it went. So, so then after that, they knew my interest and I, I don't know, I was selected for the scholarship. I went to UK, did my master's in conservation and I came back in 1987, did a lot of conservation projects. And, uh, but initially I didn't have many projects. One of the things which I did was to uh, go to Palpanavaram Palace. That's the building which I got inspiration. All the architecture which I do, everything is, I mean, as I said, Laurie Baker used to adore this building. I also learned, I used to go and see this. I used to go and see this building. I don't know how many times I visited. I studied the timber joinery, the way the drawings are given, the way the detailing is given. For example, one of the principles, this is a, one of the main entrance of one of the palaces. One important thing is that it's a hot, humid climate. 
they are looking at ventilation at the floor level. So if you look at the same photograph at the first floor level, this is the way the light is coming. You, you sleep on the floor in the olden days, there was very little furniture. If you sleep on the floor, the wind have movement has to come at the floor level. So you need to, if you give it a normal typical sill level three feet and you sleep on the floor, the wind will not sense that you are sleeping on the floor. The wind will be above your, moving above your body. So these kind of small things I realized, I experienced a traditional building. I used to go there in the morning, be there till evening, trying to study, making some drawings, making some sketches, and this is what you do. And I found how the light is being given. They, you, I mean, for example, one of the things is that in many of the traditional buildings, if you stand inside the building, you can't see the sky because the glare is completely avoided. For example, this is the same building which I shown earlier, how the inside of it, this is the ground floor and the other one is the uh, for, for, uh, for first floor of it. And this is another building in the complex. This might be one of the oldest buildings. And you see the roof is the most predominant thing you see in a typical Kerala building. Roof is very prominent. And you have the verandas in buildings. The role of the veranda is to cut down the sun's rays. You can see the sun is falling on the building, but the inside of the walls is, inside the room is very cool because the sun's rays never touch the fall on the inside of the wall because of the veranda. And if the roof comes very low so that your head should not touch it, you have a small cable. So all these principles, jalis, design, roofs, the, how the different roofs are given, uh, the timber walls, for example, this is a palace, this also very, the overhang is very important. And these timber buildings have lasted for hundreds of years. I mean, this building is built in the 19th century. It's still in good condition. It is now, most of this building is converted into a museum. So I learned timber as a material, the way the palaces are built, the way the various monuments are built, and see, for example, this is a building in the Palpanavaram Palace. You have the ventilation right at the floor level. So you see, this is one of the things. And after this timber walls is a courtyard. So there are a lot, it is a very high density buildings, but courtyards give enough light. But many of these buildings, the inside is not well lit because one reason is one inference you can make. They did not know, many of the people did not know how to read and write. I mean, the way we do reading and everything which we do now, they didn't do it at that time. So this was one of the uh, 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 floor ventilation. This is a house in my village, which is built with palm timber, but built with mud, though it is not very clear in the photograph. Uh, and this is another building in my village with the palm timber. So everything was locally sourced and the timber and the, the palm timber, the palm tree is there in this compound itself. So he changes the roof once in three years or four years and he uses, and he himself does this. There was no need for any skilled carpenter or anything. So this was a self-help kind of housing which they used to do. And this is the teach, I um, mean, a, a small teaching place where the people, everybody used to re learn the alphabets in the village. So the roof coming very low. So this is what I learned in this building. So I did some projects in the beginning. In 1992, there was a major change in my career. Mamuti, I mean, many of you in Nepal might not know about him. He's the main actor, superstar of the Malayalam movie industry. He's still the number one in the Malayalam movie industry, even after almost 30 years. So in 1992, he asked me to design his house. So again, many of the things, natural materials, exposed brickwork, I use the clay tile flooring. I used to give this roof ears where you allow the hot air to escape. So many of the traditional elements I try to use in this house. And in this, I use recycled timber in an extensive manner. We bought an old house and used the timber. So we did not try to, I mean, a lot of timber was used in the building. And this was featured in one of the magazines where I wrote an article. I just put this. Uh, photo, uh, 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 article also. In 1996, there was a major change when I was asked to do Dekshina Chitra. Dekshina Chitra is a craft village in Trivandrum where the buildings from four southern states are transplanted to one particular place. They're dismantled as well as there are common buildings. This is the main entrance building of the Dekshina Chitra Crafts Museum. You can see the courtyards. And uh, I've done the uh, 
most of the public buildings except one i have done the public buildings in those places like the restaurant the gallery uh, and the craft bazaar so most of these buildings are done by me as well as i have helped in transplantation of most of the buildings so this is the courtyard so the courtyard which is there we use recycled columns uh, the brief which was given to me that we want to have a contemporary building but built with some traditional materials so that we we can people can be convinced that the traditional architecture or the vernacular architecture is very important so this is the restaurant and the stores and the gallery and the library etc so this is uh, i mean more extensions have been made to this building so i use the same principle palpanavaram palace what i saw roofs at different heights verandas courtyards these were the three things which i learned from the palpanavaram palace that is what i applied it in those building in 2002 i got the designer of the year award which was a major change i mean till then i was the first time my work is being published in english magazine so 18 years after i passed out this work is coming and this is the house i'll just quickly run through the house this was a house which i did in chennai city and uh, i'm just i mean with a, this, this was a farm house for a person in Chen, uh, in chennai so this was the the pond which is attached to that house this is the entrance so you can see all these elements of the roofs uh, traditional this is the chitina tiles which is uh, very which much cheaper than the ceramic tiles that you get very traditional used in buildings for more than 100 years i use stone in these buildings so many of the features which i have learned i mean i use the recycled windows i use the recycled doors trying to do very simple buildings in a, in a, in a survey and all these elements those triangular niches um uh, more i mean the mat or the roof all these materials were local material but sourced from uh, locally and that is what i did one of the things in my project one of the things you will say i did not follow any particular style as such there was no style which i followed i mean although i learned from lorry baker he had a particular style mostly he has done exposed brick work and particular style i deviated from it so i did buildings in my thing but i did not create a my style of my own i did all kinds of buildings none of my buildings look the same i did not look at modernity or tradition i try to combine the both i try to take the best out of it which will be suitable for the uh, the context and the project which is there and i try to be very uh, deviate from the conventional buildings so i try to be unconventional and try to do the buildings which is very different i was very lucky to get lifetime projects i was able to design houses for the uh, uh, so the film stars or bis top business people or the top politicians i i just got and pip projects like dakshina chitra i was able to do and my projects range from 100 square feet to 1 million square feet so i had done huge projects so i have done small projects during my career but if i look back there were two reasons for my success one is that my design were i mean i think that since i did not study in architecture school my designs were very different but i looked at to the i designed for the people or the occupants so that was one thing which is there and i think i think that my designs were improving the quality of life whether it's a tsunami rehabilitation project or a residence or any of those things so uh, trying to do now i'm just trying to quickly run through two three things how can sustainability be brought into design which i i'll just try to go go, go into the into into the details this is one of the buildings where i use interlocking mud blocks or earth blocks no cement mortar is used and it's a two story concrete roof but on the top we are given a a uh, truss roof made out of steel but the ground floor verandas and the carports etc is built with timber you can see the see that uh, see the timber this is the rear side of the building where a lily pond is also there but you can see the roof is varying quite a bit and one of the things i give tremendous importance is to the conservation of technology and crafts uh, for example i was part of a trust which is a uh, which has worked on the reviving the chitinad egg plastering this is a smooth finish where uh, using the lime various coats of lime where you can see the face on to the on a plaster so we did a training program as part of the uh, mrmrm cultural foundation as part of the trust so our office was in the forefront in trying to do we were training masons and carpenters so this was a dying craft but we were able to revive it 
And Atangudi tiles, I mean, the earlier picture which I showed, we had used these traditional Atangudi tiles. And uh, when I started ordering tiles from these places, there were hardly five or 10 factories, but now there are hundreds of factories. It is used extensively, but this was one of the traditional building materials. So once you give more job to the, I mean, this, you see this one where the Atangudi tiles are used. So this is the tile, which is no electricity is used, no burning of anything is there. It is a, now it is made using cement. Traditionally, they use lime mortar for making these tiles. So I used, and also try, as I said, the red oxide flooring, the green oxide, the black oxide, we try to bring in and the craftsmanships. And we use locally available materials, which was one of the main things, natural materials and locally available material. This is the resort which we have done for one of the resort groups. So we use stones which were, I mean, it is not quarried stone, it is taken from the same locality. Stones picked up from, uh, many of these hilly areas has these stones which are, so you can see the stone which is picked up from the locality. We just did the entire resort using that stone. Only in the upper floors, we did not use that stone because we, I mean, I mean, a thick wall which has to be carried so high is not very easy to do. Again, we have used the Athambudi tiles and this is a very popular resort. I mean, the, you can see the swimming pool and the resort. So we made each of the cottage like a small village, which is there. And another specialty of my buildings is that I used extensive use of timber for the last 30 years, 30, 30 years. This building is entirely, you see the masonry only in that front portion. The rest of the thing is completely timber and glass. I don't use glass much in buildings in places like in Chennai, but I use a lot of glass sometimes in glass buildings in places where the climate is very cold, hill stations, where you have to let in, bring in more sunlight, whereas in Chennai, you want to keep out the sunlight. So the difference, but here the timber is used for the flooring, for the walls, for the roof. Uh, everywhere we use the extensive use of the timber. Uh, because it, as I said, is considered to be the most sustainable building material. Uh, now, I mean, the photographs of that thing. I mean, the ceiling is also made of timber. In many other projects, we use recycled timber. For example, this is a restaurant in a resort where we have used uh, timber walls. I mean, the entire walls is timber, except for that where the kitchen is coming, we have just added a very little base masonry work for that. More than, I mean, if four walls are there, three and a walls is built with entirely with timber, timber kind of. So I use extensive use of timber, which is one of my use, uh, unique things in many of my projects. The other is other thing uh, about my buildings, I use recycled materials. I source, for example, the tiles have come from, uh, entire tiles is come from demolished building. The doors have come from a building which, um, uh, by building which is demolished. And I try to make use of this. The cost of construction is very cheap when you try to use these recycled material. And this was originally designed as an office. Now it has become a residence. This is another house of a writer called Tishani Doshi. You can see the front door is a recycled door. The windows are recycled. So one of the things, I mean, we, we, we just go and search for these old materials and try to integrate in the, into, 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 the, into these buildings. If the price is very cheap. That windows, recycled doors and windows are available at one third of the price of a new timber. Now, the other thing is that the vernacular architecture is used in contemporary design, which is one of the things. Uh, I don't use a vernacular architecture the way it is. I try to interpret it or I try to make some changes to it uh, because uh, it, I, I don't use it as a style. I use it as a knowledge system. So, uh, uh, for example, in this, for this is a new resort which we have done. Again, you can see the recycled material. Uh, tiles, but uh, we try to, I mean, uh, try to do the buildings in a, a different way, learning from the principles of the vernacular architecture. This is a night view of the same resort. I mean, the entire resort is done with this completely sourced from demolished buildings. And it is available at one tenth of the cost of a new roofing material because roof covering material, because it's a, because it's a, it's a, it's a material where well, we you please take it away uh, I mean, when I started using many of these materials, people said, please take it away. There, there was not a price attached to it, but over a period of time, when I go there again and try to get these materials, they started charging a little bit on the on those things. So this is a result. 
another important thing is that i think my, one of my one of our efforts in the office is to make the architecture more human uh, there was a social content uh, architecture has a social dimension uh, it is to improve the life of the people it should benefit the people so we try to see whatever designs we try to do we try to bring it consciously into our design this is the institute of palliative medicine we did in the uh, calicut medical college compound so uh, there is the institutional part as well as the hospital part which is i mean palliative institute means um, a hospital part those are the patients who come there during the last 30 uh, 15 days or 30 days of their life so we wanted a nice place for them to spend the last few days i interviewed the staff and we did a initial study and we found that nobody wants to die in a hospital everybody wants to die in a when we asked them where do you want, what kind of space you want to be when you die or where do you want to spend the last few days everybody says we don't want to spend time in the hospital we want to so we try to design a hospital which doesn't look like a hospital so we did not use tiles we use tiles only for the bathrooms that to the minimum and uh, we use all kinds of colors hospitals are normally white in color we did not we or uh, this hospital has all kinds of colors we use the jalis palpanaburam palace as the chimba jalis we use the terracotta jalis so each of the cluster we said one cluster with the ochre color one with the blue another one with green so like that we called it clusters and we designed the we try to do some research into color therapy and then do so he is a patient so he doesn't know that i am the architect so i just, i mean i just i met him one day and asked him how do you feel after coming here and he said that half my illness is gone when i reach here so this is a kind of feeling which the hospital should be creating in people so and if you design the buildings to treat, uh, the occupants or the people who are going to use are very very important and when i designed the building i mean you can see first time my name is uh, inscribed on a stone plaque it was this this project i did it in 2003 and this is uh, another project which i'm i'm uh, uh, trying to run a bit fast in trying to finish in 10 15 minutes so this is a project which we have, i mean we have done a i mean i'll be talking about that project a little bit later we were trying to do the restoration of a church in a historic area you have a what you see on the left is with it looks like the uh, advertisement of a paint company this is how it looked like when we did it so we try to tell the church people and the occupants and i mean inhabitants and all those things that uh, it will be much nicer if you change the color into a light color it will look much better but to our surprise people came and told us that they do want to demolish the chapel which they built in the 1980s because our process of doing the conservation of the market or conservation of this church was very different we did never try to impose our ideas onto the client or to us if we, are, we now do a lot of large scale projects where we involve even do the master plans or uplifting of an area rehabilitation but we try to consult the people take their consensus which is very very important so because of that the church people and the local inhabit church goers and everybody came forward they said that they want to demolish the church they asked me if you demolish the church will you design i said i will design so i gave them two design one is a replica of the chapel which was there earlier and a new church which looks traditional but looks a little bit more contemporary but to my surprise they chose the very replica of the church they know we want the old church to come so the chapel which was demolished in 1980s was reconstructed in 2014 uh, or so so uh, most of my buildings uh, uh, one of the things like palpanaburam palace the front elevation is not that important all the elevations are important and if a building is if you are doing good architect there is good architecture and bad architecture if you do good architecture then the buildings will be more beautiful than those in the photographs and i think very strongly that my buildings look much more beautiful uh, in the uh, uh, for uh, much more beautiful in uh, in in reality than those in the photographs now this is a tsunami rehabilitation project in nepal you have lot of disasters i worked in few disaster projects as well so most of the principles which i mentioned earlier working with the people and all those things are very important so this is thanko bar or tarangambadi it is called where 1500 houses have to be constructed 
because these houses were lost in the tsunami. But we took a process of dialoguing with each family, which is a, it was something which, I mean, where dialoguing with each family is not very easy. We gave them an offering of six designs, which they can take one of these six designs in which they can customize. And we allowed the customization. We allowed these. So what we found is that when we were doing this project, each one wanted to do the puja in India. It definitely in Nepal, when they start the construction of the house, they want to do the puja, they'll invite everybody. So although this was a mass housing project, then the houses were allocated because if the construction has to be customized, you have to allocate the plot. So this is what we, we had, everybody started doing it. So we've said that the Tarangambadi cluster, 16th uh, unit and uh, fifth house. 16 cluster and fifth house. And it belongs to Velu and Mutalishmi. We were very, try to make sure the gender equality is kept in these houses. So we said that when these mass houses were planned, we said both the husband and wife will get the ownership of the land. Because uh, So that is why we wrote the name. And uh, finally, when the village process were constructed, we allowed them to choose the colors, setbacks, the designs, all those things. What we found as part of almost 50% of the people chose a design which suited their, uh, their traditional house where they were living earlier. But there were a lot of people who uh, deviated from it. Now I just want to, there were two books which has come out of this project as part of this. And one of the things is that, uh, for example, in this, we were lucky that this architect I mean, this uh, was an interview conducted by a German architect and the German architect, she, she met me also. So I was very curious to know what these people are thinking. And I'm just reading out from one statement, which is the, in the book, which she has brought, it, brought out. We were lucky that this architect worked on our project. Many things are well done. However, however there are some things that could have been done much better. For example, the orientation of the bathroom and the toilet. They should not face the neighbor's house. We had to build compound walls. And there, there is the quality of construction, which is in some cases poor, better of course than in many other villages that we saw, however, not always satisfying. Who I would like to build my house with? I would call this architect again, if you would like to plan a single small house. I would tell him about the toilet and the quality, but I think he goes for big projects in cities only. So I would call the Mason. See, disaster projects is one where there are there are people who have said the, uh, famous planners, etc. Architects should be the last person to enter a disaster rehabilitation project. But I think architect has a role to play. Instead of mass construction of the houses, it is important to customize the house. Just like if a client who is living in a city who is in the upper class or the upper middle class, have the way you customize the houses. I mean, each of these people, they are architecturally illiterate people. They don't know what to ask for. But if you dialogue with them, you will be able to do a house which is uh, uh, very different and how, I mean, you should be able to do. Now, how can conservation lead to development? I mean, this is one of the, because 50% of our projects are conservation. And this is a old house converted into a boutique portal. Five rooms are there. And uh, so you are recycling the whole house whole building, which is very sustainable in the long run. So we try to keep the character, the old character of the house. Many of the villages, these kind of houses are not used now because the people are moved to the cities, they are abundant. So there is a large economic opportunity to convert these into people to use it as a farm, I mean, a second home or as a booty hotel. This is one of the houses and the projects is doing reasonably well in terms of the things. And I've done the Musiris Heritage Project, which is one of the largest conservation projects in India. I was not very keen on doing government projects. We don't do government projects, but now I think it's very important to do government projects because many of the opportunities which you do in government, you will not get in private projects. So this is an old Cochin Prime Minister's Palace, which you have converted into a museum. And we have done the conservation of this. So you can see the before and after pictures. The above is the after, the, because it was in a damaged position. So as I said, it is converted into a museum. You can see the TV screens in this thing. And uh, conservation means not conserving the monuments and the palaces alone. This is one of the, we have been involved in some ordinary conservation projects that are restoring the ordinary buildings or conserving the ordinary buildings. This is a market. I'm just beautiful buildings in the market. 
I mean, where things are kept in a wholesale market, daily things is coming. You can see the building on the right, uh, where the, uh, you can see the before and after pictures, the way we are trying to interfere. Building which is on the left is before, right hand side is after. So we have been involved, not only in the case of monuments and palaces, we were just, these are the buildings which change the life of the people. I mean, uh, so you can see how, and these are the projects which will create an awareness among the local community. And in the same market area, the waterfront, this was a traditional market. So the water, I mean, Kerala, the backwaters and the rivers, the goods were transported across the water. So we have converted into a waterfront with an amphitheater. And you can see the people taking over the amphitheater holding programs there. So these are the, I mean, public design is very bad in India. So, the, but if you go abroad in Europe, et cetera, they give so much importance to public design. It's very, very important to create public spaces and design them properly, et cetera. This is very important. And this is another project is uh, the oldest mosque in India. And what you see is the old black and white photograph of the mosque. And this is another photograph of the mosque, which is there, but a lot of additions and minarets and domes and concrete and uh, trust work has been done as part of this project. This project came to us to restore it back. We gave some two proposal of which one proposal was accepted because the problem is that the old mosque, if we restore it, it will carry only 300 people. We dialogue with the mosque authorities and the public and all those things. We came out with a design and uh, the decision was to construct a basement. So this is how it will look after the restoration of the mosque. And another view of the mosque, we wanted places where they can wash their feet and put their chapels and buy some information booklets. And uh, this is, uh, although the mosque authorities say that it is 7th century, historians say it's 11th century mosque. Even if it's 11th century mosque, it will be one of the older, it is the oldest mosque in India. So we, the, it is, so they wanted a capacity, we kept us 2000. So we had to construct a basement. And we have started the construction of this basement, but the basement should not look like a car park. So we try to bring in some elements when the Islam, before the Islamic architecture and the Christian architecture bifurcated. So we took some of those elements and we did not take elements from the Persian. In India, most of the mosques are elements from the Persian architecture. We did not take that style. We took it uh, a style which is slightly different. And you can see the, ugly concrete addition, the truss has been removed. It is in the process. Now it has been, come. all the ugly additions have been completely removed and uh, we are in the process of restoring the mosque. And this is one project which we won in an international competition in Prague, which was a major breakthrough which we made. Uh, to, uh, it is around 2,30,000, 36,000 uh, square feet of a hotel, hotel and spa project in some of the, I mean, three historical buildings together. Three bins is not small. Each building is 50,000, 80,000 square feet, two lakh 36,000. There were some additions, which is part of the part of the project. So we were just trying to, we won the competition and we did the scheme for this, uh, this project. And since I never worked in an office in my career also, there was a lack of professionalism. I mean, it was a one man show. We never followed the deadlines. There were a lot of mistakes in the drawings. And this is a typical Indian attitude. I think the Nepalese attitude will also, will also not be the same. Whereas, I mean, people coming, when we worked with the project in Prague, we realized that even a small mistake is very, very important. Following deadlines is very important. It has to have a very professional atmosphere. We struggled in the project to be the architect, scheme architects. We worked on the project for 21 months every month. I or many of my team members were making trips to uh, Europe, uh, to Prague, but uh, we, we, this was one of the, I, I realized that many of the Indian firms have this, this issue. But then what led to the success, I will say the passion that we showed in the projects, the emotional commitment we made in the, uh, we, we, we were committed to the projects that we were doing, we showed in the final output, and there was always a pain. It is not easy to create a nice design, different design. There is always ups and downs. I mean, trade-offs involved, but uh, we never gave up. I mean, many of these principles, which I mentioned, we try to keep it. And uh, as I said, I mean, uh, in 2002, three, et cetera, I mean, when the projects, my projects, I won the designer of the year award after that also, I won 
some of the awards. I am very careful that I don't fall into the trap of being famous and busy. So I am very happy doing work in my place. I don't go much into the meetings, public relations or giving lectures. When you do all these things, you fall, you are falling into the famous and busy trap. And once you fall into the famous and busy trap, you will never be able to do good work because you don't have time to look after your projects. You are busy in attending committees, giving lectures and uh, doing. It's very, very important to question what one is doing, which is one of, one of the things that I, I try to do. I think Purbusia questioned the architecture at that time. Everybody who have been able to make changes or may question many of the things which was happening at that time. I took a PhD or a doctorate and it was not one which was, uh, I mean, I had to work very hard for it. It is from the Indian, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. I took my doctorate, it's not very easy. And I think because I realized that I'm not reading much or anything once you get busy in practice. Once you get busy in practice, you don't increase your knowledge. That is why when I decided, I decided to go, to go and do this PhD. It is very important to have the right balance between research and academics. I'm not into academics, but we have, if you want to bring in innovation, you have to read, you have to research. So that way, Doing the PhD, getting the PhD helped me tremendously in my career. I tell everybody that they have to take a PhD at some point in their career. I wrote some books of which the Heritage Management Plan, I was one of the editors, Conserving Timber Structures in India, etc. So I wrote some books because based on my experience, these were done for uh, each of the requirements as such. And when the Kerala floods came, uh, in 2018, I wrote a book. I mean, this book is about 180 pages with the illustrations, how to do, how to repair the buildings, how to do new buildings in a floodplain area, what are the things, things to do? Because Kerala, the, this floods are not, such a devastating flood has never come in the last 100 years. So I gave the guidelines. I mean, all the illustrations were done in my, my office itself how to, I mean, if future floods comes, what are the precautions? As a professional, you have a role to play. You have to give your suggestions. And luckily in this case, the government of Kerala came and published this book. They printed and distributed these copies along among all the local bodies and people involved with floods and other, other things. I was lucky to be there. Although, as I said earlier, I don't have a degree in architecture. I was there by featured by, helped by everybody, all the magazines, fabulous, 50, I won the Lifetime Achievement Award with this thing and when I was 55, uh, 55 years old. And I told the thing that uh, although I'm getting the Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, I'm not going to retire from, from the career. I'm going to be seriously involved. Normally, they give the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, when somebody is you know, on the verge of retirement kind of thing. And uh, some people ask me, how do you do these interesting projects? I say that projects comes to you as an ordinary project. You as an architect or a designer, it's for you to make it interesting. How do you make it interesting? Put your emotions, passion, brain, everything into it. Then even a small project, even a hundred square feet can be a very, very interesting project or an innovative project. So this is the way. Uh, but the way the industry works is slightly different. And uh, I've heard many people blaming various things. I don't want to blame anything. It's the poor workman who blames his tools. You get on to what you have, do that the best way one, but try to give the best answer, try to do it in the best possible manner. I've never gone after projects. I never gone and asked projects to anybody. I never marketed my, myself or never given publicity, which we keep it as a project, but I have had enough projects in my career. And I don't think even the Corona time also, I will have enough projects, which is very important. So just do the work very, very truthfully. And if you, one of the things many youngsters ask is that, do you make money in this process? I mean, if you ask me whether I made money, I mean, initial years were very struggling. It is not very easy. This is, uh, I mean, any professional, this is, I mean, it's a very common thing. The first stage, any profession, whether it's an advocate or an architect, it's more or less the same. When you are very young, you have a lot of ideas, but no projects. This is the first stage. Then comes the second stage. Many people are making compromises at that stage. A lot of ideas, but no projects. 
then you have a, you reach a stage where you have projects but you never make money in the projects that's the second stage and many people will not be able to hold on to that then comes the third stage where you don't have to do anything but a lot of projects pour into you and you make money in the third project that happens in the third stage so many of the uh, senior architects and the professionals i don't think i've reached the third stage i hope that i will reach there uh, not very far and things like that i did some mistakes in my career one of the things is that initially i tried to do single things in single handedly it was a one man show i never tried to develop a team i never tried to develop a system in the office i never believed in presentation i did i enjoyed what i did all these years and that is what i did but if you want to influence the inner generation you, you and you want to pass on the knowledge which you have which you have acquired over the years to the inner generation you have to have a system you have to develop a team then you will be able to do much more so when i did the prague project i realized that doing single handedly is not easy it is important to develop a team and a system and it is important to do proper presentation so i learned from all these mistakes i try to correct these mistakes during the last 5 years and uh, uh, if doing a phd although i never into academics i think it was the right decision which i made one of the i, I sometimes i say after i mean i am uh, my wife i mean my wed marriage is the first decision i made which was i think is the best decision i made in my life which is to marry my, um, uh, her milly and the second best decision i made my my career is to do a phd but there were certain things which i will say i changed when i started my career worked on cost effective housing then there was a time when i worked on conservation there was a time when i worked on vanaklo architecture i worked in three disaster resistant projects one two projects for the tsunami i worked in the maharashtra earthquake i designed a village gujarat earthquake i designed a village there so all these things uh, work changing the fields is also important you should not do the same thing for more than 5 years or 7 years you should change your emphasis and thrust because otherwise it is boring it is something which will kill your innovate innovation completely so this is a conscious i mean uh, partly a conscious decision which i made partly it came accidentally in my thing and uh, one of the major mistakes i realized during the last two years is that we never went into mainstream architecture uh, uh, it's very very important to get into mainstream architecture because the mainstream the apartments villa projects shopping malls Uh, IT parks. These are the projects which are changing the face of the architecture scene in any country. So it's I I although some of these projects came to me, I said I'm not interested to do this apartment because there is no creativity. There is no place you want to sell the place. But uh, about two or three years ago, I realized that that is a mistake. It is very important for us to get into mainstream uh, projects. Now we are doing apartments. We are doing villa projects. This project will be inaugurated in the next four months. I mean, this is a 3D visualization. But this is a decision which we have made during the last three years, where we this now we do try to do this interiors and other projects now. interiors and apartments and real estate projects because these are the projects which change the face of the cities and our towns so if we say that uh, we try to do our project as an alternate stream it is not the right decision so now we will be into uh, all these kind of uh, projects in the coming years uh, that is what we are trying to do always face this question of not getting qualified i lost lot of projects because i am not qualified i don't have a degree i can't take part in many of the government projects uh, because they see some of the government projects i've done because they change the qualification to uh, so that i can apply if they say that you are an architect you have to be an architect i never partnered with any architect my son is an architect but i still he is not part of my office uh, uh, my nephew is an architect both are qualified architects they are not part of my office so although i'm not qualified i lost lot of projects but i think all those things taught me every any any lesson which is to be done now regarding the future i just think it is a role is very very important for our architects to be very much aware of the climate change and the global warming which is happening 
And uh, as part of the office, we have set up a sustainable research lab. I've taken some people exclusively for it. I want to do research in sustainable architecture. I have my research experience, but I never taught anywhere. So I want to use my research experience in setting up this research lab in my office. In India and Southeast Asian countries, this is not a very common feature, but abroad there are big architecture firms have research labs within their office. So I decided to set this up because there is a huge gap between academia and practice as far as sustainability is concerned. Academia is saying more many of these things, but in practice, these things never happen. I just want to bridge that gap, bridge that gap. And also I would like to look at how the Indian situation is very different. Many of the research, many of the findings which they find out in the Europe is not applicable to India as such. So we have to look at things in a completely different way. And that is, that is very important. So we want to do bridge the gap between the practice and there are some other objectives right? because of the lack of time and not, not going in details into it. So uh, I, I'm, I would, uh, 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 we hope that during the next five years or 10 years, we'll be able to do projects. We'll be able to bring some value into the design field. And uh, one of the other things which I hope that I'll be able to do is to train some youngsters. I have a team now. I'm developing a system in my office. I would like to train them in various aspects which I've learned. I took, took it was very, it took a lot of time for me to learn these things which I want to put it into uh, practice now. I, I think that is the last slide. I will stop sharing. If there are any questions, I will take uh, 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 any any questions which is uh, there are there. Uh, thank you, Benny, sir, for such an enlightening session and elaborating so eloquently and clearly on your architectural journey through the years. I'm sure this will be very beneficial to all the architecture students and young architects who are watching us today uh, and hope that it will inspire many more to explore uh, vernacular architecture and learn from it. Um, yes, we actually do have quite a few questions now, so let's move on to the question and answer uh, session. The first one uh, is, is by Abby uh, from Cochin, uh, Kerala, and, it, and he says that uh, I'm in love with architecture. I've been traveling to places for years now to see works of master architects like Jeffrey Bauer, Laurie Baker, and many more. I now do my own house, and as my first attempt to become an architect, I want to learn it professionally. Can you guide me how to move forward? Uh, it is a bit difficult to tell because uh, normally people study five years of architecture, then after that they do two years of masters, etc. Uh, one of the things is that architecture is nothing but common sense. Uh, well, but common sense is not common either. But uh, see, it is, a, it is a profession which requires a lot of skills. You have to be good at technical knowledge. You have to need to have a good aesthetic sense. And you should have a good communication skills. Uh, I need to, uh, so uh, the important thing is to learn from, uh, uh, I mean, it's not the bookish knowledge alone is not sufficient. And uh, I, I, what inspired me in spite of not having any degree in architecture is that many of the top architects which whom I admire don't have a degree in architecture like me. Frank Lloyd Wright doesn't have a degree. Corbusier doesn't have a degree. B.V. Doshi doesn't have a degree. Tadao Anto doesn't have a degree. Peter Sunto doesn't have a degree. Louis Sullivan doesn't have a degree. So there are a lot of these, I mean, uh, uh, there are a uh, 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 lot of these famous architects who don't have a degree. It is not the degree which is important. It is your knowledge and your approach to design, which is very important. If you don't have that, you can acquire over the years. It is a bit difficult to answer it in a webinar of this question. Uh, but uh, I mean, I just try to give some gen general guidelines on these things. Okay, uh, I think the next question we were taking from Facebook, uh, Harshita Agarwal um, is asking us, how would, you, how would these local and sustainable materials support commercial structures which require structural strength? See, uh, each project has to be looked at separately. 
depending on the context and the requirements and the functions and all those things. Uh, I am not saying that we should never use concrete. You have to use concrete when it is required. You have to use steel when it is required. You might use a combination of steel and timber when it is required. So each project has to be seen in, in its own way. And uh, uh, so I've done big projects within the city. The sustainability, you see, I can't sort all the projects are sustainable to the highest level, no. Depending on the project, some projects will be highly sustainable, some projects will be less sustainable. And you are not doing an academic research or project. You are dealing with clients. Clients will have so many requirements. So if, for example, if I want to use, say, recycled timber in a project and the client says that, no, my belief is that recycled timber is not good. I mean, if you, this, you are adamant on it, you will get out of the project. The client will go to another architect. When you do practice, you have to keep a balance. The important thing is to try to convince the client to the most uh, maximum extent and uh, then try to do so. Even within cities, we have to look at the context, we have to look at the situation, we have to look at various dimensions, like social dimensions, cultural dimensions, uh, not, to, not only at the cost alone is not the criteria. So many of the buildings I'm able to convince saying that if you do these steps in the design, then the buildings will be more thermally comfortable. I'm able to convince my clients on the sloping roof. I've been doing sloping roofs. I've done flat roofs also, but most of my buildings are sloping roofs, trying to tell them that you will save. So my, one of the things which I do mostly recently is to have a flat RCC slab, but on top of that, give a steel truss roof. And we did some calculations in the office. It convinced us that over a period of six to eight years, the advantage of the ther better thermal comfort because of the double roof will offset the increase in cost. You understand, these are the colors. So we convinced the client saying that there is a 15% increase in cost, but or in the long run, you save that money because of the increased thermal comfort, uh, less air conditioning costs. If they use, a, they use the air conditioners, we try to convince them. So it is mainly the calculus. So if you want to use sustainability, use local materials, natural materials in the best possible manner, you need to have higher knowledge. You should know about the materials. You should know about your calculations and all these, all, all this. So you should be able to convince, convince the clients about these things. So there is no hard and fast rule. Everything is right, everything is wrong, depending on the context and uh, the thing. So I'm not making a romantic view that you, all buildings should be constructed with timber or only vernacular materials should be used or natural materials should be used. No, I don't have a romantic view. I use concrete, I use steel, I use a combination of these materials. So, and uh, it depends on the clients as well. So, but you should be able to do the best possible thing in the given situation instead of following one particular style or one particular technology. We have done buildings with earth, we have done buildings with stone, we have done buildings with bricks and brick and plaster, we have done exposed brickwork buildings. And we have done buildings, as I showed in the hill stations, very little masonry, mostly timber and glass. So I have used all these different conditions. It depends on the conditions in which you are using these things. So, so you might have to use concrete if you, in, in case you want to go with a large span building or a multi-story structure. Although timber structures are pro using cross, multi-story buildings are constructed using cross laminated timber. I was just dialoguing with an architect in Netherlands today morning and he wants to sell, I mean, he wants to see the possibility of doing cross laminated timber. They are in Europe also, cross laminated timber. There are the buildings which are being designed. The architects don't do the structural design or anything. The firms which is selling cross laminated timber is doing the design. Here, if so I told him that the biggest hindrance in India in becoming cross laminated timber and constructing multi-story, our structural engineers don't know how to do the structures of a multi-story cross laminated timber building. So you have to bring in not only the material, you have to bring in the know-how or the structural design also as part of it. Then only you will be successful. 
So knowledge is very, very important in trying to make the right decisions. Thank you, sir. Just uh, building upon that, um, you know, post the uh, 2015 earthquake here in Nepal, there's a general perception that, uh, you know, pillar concrete uh, structures are stronger than traditional buildings. And a lot of people are actually constructing these buildings, you know, in, in different places, irrespective of the climate, the region, uh, you know, in place of traditional vernacular buildings. Uh, how, what would you say to architects? How do you respond to such a situation? I'll give you two examples. I will give you two, two incidents. Because, I mean, my experience with the disaster resistant houses. I did a project in Gujarat, which uh, we did 138 houses for the Malayala Manorama newspaper. They collected the money. So they connected those. We had a dialogue with the villagers. They were all living in stone houses. I mean, houses built with stone walls. And it is the stone which fell over them. And when we tried to dialogue with them that we can build stone houses, they refused. They said, I mean, this is the psychological feeling which one has. Technologically, technically, it will be correct. But social accept acceptability is an important factor. And their experience will tell them. And they are not going to listen to an architect or an, anybody in this. So there in that village, when we put forward the stabilized, cement stabilized compressed mud blocks, they accepted it. So the entire village is built with cement stabilized compressed mud blocks. Because psychologically, they were against the stone blocks. This is one thing which has happened. I mean, this is from my experience. So it depends on their notions. We had a discussion with the fishermen when we did the tsunami houses. So there was one architect in my team, young man, I mean, we do this thing. He was very enthusiastic. He tries to convince the villagers that you should build houses with timber and uh, mango tiles, which is the way the fishermen houses were before the tsunami. The question is, so all these fishermen are sitting, we are also sitting. The question is, the fishermen asked us, what kind of houses are you living? That is the question they asked. The project manager of the team, he said, I, I mean, I've just constructed a house, it is made out of concrete. I said, I'm living in a concrete house, but it's not designed by me. I'm, uh, it's a rented building. I've never designed my own house at that time. Uh, so, so then the next question the villagers asked was that, if you are living in concrete buildings and if you are designing concrete buildings, why are you asking us to live in tiled and timber? This was the question they asked. So it is the notion of this thing. Uh, so in either case, it is the notion that RCC frame structures will survive earthquakes better. And the government is going to give them the houses uh, might be free of cost or the NGOs will be giving it. So they let them get the best bargain in the possible thing. So you have to convince them. Uh, of, uh, for example, when we did the, I did the houses in uh, Maharashtra earthquake, one of the demands of the villagers was that they wanted the concrete columns. You understand they, they had the same notion, but they were, uh, so, I mean, but our structural engineer was very convinced that you don't need a, framed structure for resisting earthquakes. But finally, we had to do, we had to put four steel roads in the corners of all the houses and the junctions and try to convince them that this is a compromise. Because the moment you go for a concrete frame structure, the cost goes up. That is one thing. The second thing is that you have to take care of corrosion. For example, in the tsunami area, the water table is very low. So five feet, if the foundation has to go, three feet will be underwater during the rainy season. Then in the concrete is done in a bad shape. Within five, five years or 10 years, the building will be in a bad shape, will be in a, in, a, in a very pitiable condition, which is what has happened in the tsunami houses, where the construction quality is poor. And when you do a building with concrete frame structure and the quality. So this is where you dialogue. There is a trade-off involved. You dialogue with the the community or the villagers, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't win. Uh, sometimes you reach a compromise. So, I mean, the, I mean, if you are able to convince them the good, in some cases you fail to convince. So, uh, as you said, I mean, uh, 
uh, I will say, but it is their perception and experience which tells them that the frame structure has survived. But uh, I try to tell in all my arguments in my thing, concrete is not a very durable building material if it is not done properly. And uh, there are hundreds of books written on how to repair concrete, how to, uh, I mean, so repairing concrete is an expensive process. If it's a traditional building, you can easily repair it, but to repair a, a leakage in a concrete road is very expensive. And it reappears again after five years or 10 years. So you have to convince them, you have to dialogue with them. This is, again, I'm coming back to the question, higher knowledge in your part is very important. The way you convince them, the way you show them the examples, you might win the situation or you might not win, win over them in the argument, but at least you can try to have a bargain with them. You do one thing and you bargain, you do, I mean, there's a compromise made in all these, these kind of projects. Yeah, I think it, it seems like human psychology is same everywhere. Yeah, um, it's true. Uh, so we have another question um, regarding the restoration of the mosque, the slide that you showed. Can you elaborate a little on how you balance the tradition with modern style or need? You see, uh, 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 as I said earlier, I'm not looking whether it is tradition or modernity. That is not what I'm looking at in any of my designs. I'm not doing it, my designs has come in a particular way, not because I like the tradition I'm doing it. Uh, I am doing it in a way which I think is right, the best way to do it. So when we did the mosque restoration, I mean, when we are doing and we had a dialogue with the uh, mosque authorities or the committee, Jamaat committee or of the thing, and uh, we tried to tell them that, see all the mosque in Kerala has the minarets and domes which is taken from the Persian architecture. And Kerala had trade relations with the Middle East thousands of years ago. So we never had the Persian architecture till very recently. But with the coming in of the Gulf money and the people going to the Gulf mosque in Kerala also underwent, underwent changes. That's how this mosque also had the minarets and the domes and all those things. So we try to convince them that we, and a mosque has to look like a mosque. So we had to go with the solution of doing below the ground level because we had to reach a particular capacity because they needed that because old mosque, when all the ugly additions are removed, it will seat only one, uh, only 300 people can pray at the same time where they wanted 2000 because it is a Juma Masjid. A lot of people come on Fridays. So they wanted a bigger capacity. We are given temporary cover covering with their rejected. So we had to go with the basement. So when the basement, typical thing is that it will look like a car park, typical basement. So we are taking some steps to how to bring in natural light through some kind of light tunnels into the thing. So we try to go with the design, which is before the Islamic architecture and the Christian architecture bifurcated. So I try, we, uh, we did some research on the 6th century and 7th century and 8th century architecture. So we use some of those elements into the when we were trying to do the design but at the same symmetry is very important in islamic architecture many of the mosques are very very symmetrical uh, we try to bring in the symmetry in the exterior design but building we cannot bring it but the building was never symmetrical because all these photographic evidence we found the foundations of old buildings when we escaped now we have done the excavation in the basement work and restoration is going on work has happened as i showed one picture one photograph where the demolition is happening. The workers advanced quite a bit. If, if it was because of, if it was not of Corona, it would have gone much faster. So while we did, we found the foundations of old buildings. So symmetry was, not, but we try to look at some of the principles of the Islamic. Now this design we have done few years ago. Now the finally when the thing now uh, even uh, we are rethinking at some of the design interior details. Because one of the criticism which we have found out now is that you are again using foreign elements. Why don't you use typical Kerala traditional elements in the interior? So uh, we might definitely we will we, we are trying to rethink about the design uh, by by the time we have to discuss with the mosque authorities. We have made out some ideas. I'll be discussing with the mosque authorities. If they also agree with the design, we might try to change it. So it's not a question of tradition or modernity. What is apt, what is sustainable, what is, uh, 
much more human. Those are the kind of preferences which I try to illustrate it in my talk. Those are our priorities. We are not looking at the elevation of the building when we design because many we don't show the elevation to any of our clients because we say elevation follows the plan and section. Uh, so uh, once you have the plan and section, elevation follows it. And we, I mean, decoration is there in some of our projects, but that is done in, in a very different way. So that's the, my answer to that question. I hope that it has been answered. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Um, and it says, uh, you are a self-taught architect. What do you suggest to young architects who are often fascinated by the international style? Okay, my advice to them, uh, one thing is that one of the thing is that you see, you learn from books, you learn from others. That is important. I'm not saying book learning is bad or what you learn in schools. The important thing is to learn from the craftsmen, from your own heritage, your own knowledge system. And this is some knowledge which is not there in the books. I have become like this because I learned working with the craftsmen, learning about the materials. As I said earlier, I just managed to take a degree. I have, uh, but later on, when I needed the, when I had to learn it, I learned so many things from the craftsmen and this thing. So that is one thing. Many of the people you think that once you have a degree, you can straight away start designing. No, go and work in the field or just learn from a master craftsman how he does. Gurugula, I learned, I became like this because I worked with Laurie Baker. He was a master architect or star, I mean, the so-called star architect or anything. I learned from him. I saw him working. I asked him a lot of questions and he tried to teach me in a simple way. And that is what I tried to do. This is one of the things. The second thing I would like to do, I would like to tell is that, I mean, it might be questioning the architectural education. I will say, I will say that, you don't need five years to learn architecture. Many of the things you learn in architecture is not, might not be required. You will never use it in practice. Uh, but there are so many things which you must have known you are not being taught. And uh, uh, so, and uh, I, for example, I think people should learn in their architecture course about Hassan Fati. They should learn about Frank Lloyd Wright. There's, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright, they will be learning. Hassan Fati, Laurie Baker, and many of the other architects who are never in textbooks. Oh, they, the people don't teach these things in textbooks. But the, the contribution which these people have made are huge, the way they have done. And, they are more, and the work of these people, like Jeffrey Bawa, are more suitable to our cultural conditions, our social conditions. But I am not a romantic person that you don't need any education, anything, uh, uh, you can learn everything from practical knowledge, no. If so, the craftsmen would have done, I mean, of course, they were doing beautiful buildings which have survived all these years, but their knowledge is more of an empirical knowledge. You need to bring in the latest know-how, knowledge, materials, structural engineering, everything, you need not, know how to do the calculations, but you should have an intuition. And once you have that, you will be able to, to do the building. So the, for the youngsters, get into the field. There are no shortcuts to do any of these things. And architecture is a creative field. It is not, architect's office is not a factory producing drawings. It is a, it is a, it is a where you discuss about various ideas. If you are innovative, if you are able to bring out uh, new ideas, definitely you will be noticed. Age is not a criteria, you will know. But if you think that it is a business, all that you need is getting projects. If I get projects, I will, I will design anything which I want. It is a very, very wrong call. If you are able to innovate, even in a small toilet addition you get, that client will recommend to another person and he will get projects. Even the, I never had to look back and hunt for projects at any point. I, in spite of the fact that I don't have a degree. And I had, I never had to look back. I think it is because I was designing for the people and I was, my design process was very different. I was not bothered. I, I took up, 
I did all kinds of silly, I mean, small toilet additions and kitchen additions and this thing. I've not put them in, into my portfolio or any of those things, but you just start going step by step and a child doesn't learn how to run in a day. First, it will fall many times. It will walk slowly and then it will walk a little bit more faster and then it will start running. It will just try to understand. Some people is able to oh, accelerate this experience because they work very hard for it. There is no short, shortcut to success or hard work or anything. And knowledge is very, very important. This is uh, what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you, sir. I think we have time for a few more questions. Uh, so there's one more. Uh, where which timber was the hardest to work with? Which is uh, which are the usually ignored timber types in the local context of Kerala, but has worked well? You have faced uh, any superstitions related to recycled timber from clients? See the recycled timber. I'll answer the second question first. Recycled timber. Some clients think that people demolish the houses because they were not in prosperity. They had some bad uh, thing in there because. I mean, so they think that using timber from an old building is, uh, is not something which is good. There are people who believe in such superstitions. Uh, but we try to convince them that always it is when you, you are giving one more life to that timber. You are prolonging the life of the timber, which is a nice thing to do. Giving life is something which is, uh, which is one of the best things one can do in their life, in their career. So by giving life to the timber once more, instead of it being used as firewood or some cheap furniture or anything you are giving. So we, some people agree to it. Some people say that front door will go with new timber, the rest of the uh, windows, doors or roof, we can use recycled timber. So each person has their own person. There are some people think that old timber is not durable, which is not true because I've were written conserving timber structures in India. I've studied the timber in detail. Uh, it is age is not a not something which decides. I mean, a timber which is 200 years. I mean, many of the uh, timber temples built in uh, Nepal are uh, the timber might have been used 200, 300 years ago. So unless it is attacked, unless the timber is attacked by termites or insects, or it gets fungal attack because of the dampness, because of the leakage root, timber will last forever. Timber can get decayed only by at getting attacked by insects or fungal attack. So these kind of things is what, what, is, what is happening. And the, regarding the timber, I've done a little bit of my research, which working with the various people. For each purpose, each timber has to be used. For example, if you want to use a timber to make a post for a boat jetty where the boats anchor. So if you want to drive, then that timber should have very good water resistance. And it should be able to dry and alternate wetting and drying. But if you are using a timber for the roof, you can use the strength or the tensile strength is more important. You don't need a smooth finish for the roof timber. So the species of timber used for the roof is different. But when you use a timber for the furniture, smooth finish is important. Grains are important because it has to look aesthetically pleasing. What I'm trying to say, I'm just trying to put it in short. Depending on the purpose for which the timber is used, it should have different properties. One timber is, there is no universal timber. One timber which will be good for one purpose, it will not be good for another purpose. One of the very most durable timbers which you find, I'm not sure whether that timber is the this, I think that the scientific name is Mesuaphoria. It is called Ironwood. It's the train name, trade name. It is there in Kerala. It is there in Burma, Assam, and all those places. And it is there in other, definitely in other uh, African tropical evergreen forest, or a little bit similar to that condition. This timber is called Ironwood. This is one of the very few species. There are very few species of timber which will sink in water when it, all timber will sink in water when it is freshly cut or when it is wet. But this timber, even if it is dry, it will sink in water because the density of this timber, for example, the density of teak is somewhere around 700.7 kilogram per meter cube, 70% of that of water, if it is dry. But this timber is denser than water. That means it will sink in water. And it's called ironwood because it's very hot, very difficult to work, but very durable. 
because termites won't come and attack it very easily. So there are, so, but it doesn't give a smooth finish. So you can't make furniture out of it, but you can make definitely make roof timber or beams, etc. because this timber is 50% stronger than teak when you use it for a beam. This kind of traditional know-how is there with the carpenters and this, because each species has got a role to play. Uh, uh, the, for, for example, uh, another timber which is not very commonly used, I work with that timber is ebony. It is the most expensive timber in the world. Rosewood is not expensive. Ebony is its. The reserves in, across the world are almost gone. Very little reserves are available. Very little small reserves are available in India. Sri Lanka, I mean, is, uh, so India means it is in the Western Ghats. Little bit is there in Sri Lanka, little bit there in Burma, then Brazil, African countries, etc. But the ebony is very, very hard. It is again one of the species of timber will sink in water. Very hard. But it has a small drawback that if it's exposed to slight sunshine or a little bit hot temperature, it will crack. So a furniture piece, if you make out of it, it will crack into small, small piece. Hairline tacks will form on the surface. So each timber has a particular property which makes it suitable for each of the requirements. And uh, you have to choose the best one. And by having this knowledge about timber, I choose timber species which are cheaper than teak, but stronger than 50% uh, st stronger than teak for my roof. But when it comes to furniture, I use various species of timber. So depending on the knowledge, you work it out. This is a huge knowledge. Unfortunately, our modern engineering education or architectural education failed to look at this traditional know-how which we had. And this is something which has to be brought out so uh, there are uh, uh, so I talked about two timbers which are very hard and strong, than teak or rosewood. Uh, there, there are many more, uh, much many more species uh, similar to this. Okay. Uh, thank you for that detailed explanation, sir. Uh, I think uh, we'll take one last question. Yeah. Uh, so this is a slightly long one. So bear with me. Uh, so this question is regarding a sense of aesthetics. Our traditional vernacular is mostly based on locally sourced materials, local climatic conditions, occupation, and function. The vernacular today has become globalized and homogenized. There is an increasing attraction towards newness, new materials, design, technology. It seems that local is not valued as much. Uh, we are becoming global citizens and want our built environment to reflect it. Do you think that our sense of aesthetics is changing? No, I, I don't think this is correct. Now, a lot of people use the word. I mean, of course, 90s, 90s, India went into globalization and uh, all those things. But now a lot of people are talking about local. Global at the same time being local also. Uh, because the way the typical international style of architecture or the typical globalization is not going to work in the time of the climate change and uh, global warming and all these things. So we have to look at sustainable ways of building. And when you look at sustainable ways of building, you have to look at the local vernacular style or local traditional style. Everything might not be sustainable, which is local. I tried to write a blog last week on that everything vernacular may not be sustainable. It's in my website, the blog is there. Uh, but, uh, the vernacular or the traditional things will be able to teach you so many things. I think the in the 1920s when Corbusier wrote those books, etc., he is arguing for apartments and concrete and the, inter, the so called international style of architecture. What he says in his argument is that we have a technology by which we can go 50 floors or 50 stories technology. So the issue of land is no longer relevant because we were building only two stories and three stories. Now 50 stories is possible. And we don't no longer have to design according to the climate because we can create an artificial climate, thermal comfort inside by air conditioning or by heating if it is in a cold climate. So why should we design according to the climate? When Corbusier made this argument in 1920s, energy crisis, nobody thought that petroleum is going to end, coal is going to end, energy crisis is going to come, global warming is going to come, 
uh, our ozone layer is going, going to get depleted with the air conditioning gases, but now things have changed. So it is, it is, it is becoming very, very, according to me, it is becoming very, very relevant that we become local. We take the best of the international style. We take the best of the local vernacular architecture style, combine both. I'm not arguing for building exactly in the traditional style, which I think is not possible. And I don't design exactly like the way the villagers are doing it because you don't need an architect to do it. But we have to take the best of both. And I think that is much more relevance in the coming years. And that is what is the required in the future. Uh, thank you, Benny, sir. I think we're out of time now. So this is the end of the webinar. webinar. Um, yeah. On behalf of Sona, I want to once again thank you for your webinar session. Um, and everyone who have joined us today for your valued presence. Uh, we hope to have your continued support in the future uh, sessions. Thank you all and hope you have a good day. I also thank Sona for inviting me to do this, or this, do this talk. I hope everybody could have uh, enjoyed or some lessons or some points. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you, sir.